Can we say praise the Lord? How many of you want some drops to fall on you in this place? Can anybody say, even me, even me, Lord? Let some drops fall on me. me. Well, it's good to be in Toronto. Are you glad to be in church today? I'm glad to be in Toronto, and I'm glad to bring you greetings from the greatest educational institution on the top side of the earth. Amen. Oakwood University. And we bring you greetings, of course, from our president, Leslie Pollard, who is doing a tremendous job there in Huntsville. Let me get a sense of how many of y'all have ever visited Oakwood. Have you ever visited Oakwood or attended Oakwood? Wave your hand at me. Were you blessed when you came? Well, some great things are going on there, and we want you to attend Alumni Weekend or want you to attend any of the conferences that we have there on a regular basis. But short of the power of God, I think the greatest thing that we have going for us at Oakwood are our students. Amen, somebody. Would you put your hands together if you appreciate VOT, these musicians? Come on, let's do better than that for the powerful job that they have done. Amen. I want to say God bless Wayne. This is one of my buddies. You're say, you know, uh, I say this on the road a lot, but the Lord knows who to put where. Come on, somebody. And he is a gifted preacher. And uh, I always tell him, uh, when I grow up, I want to dress like him. Amen. He's been a snazzy dresser since we were in uh, seminary, and it's good to be here. And all of the associate pastors who are here, this is the first time that I've been back to Toronto since General Conference. And uh, this is a beautiful city. I can't afford to live here, but it's a beautiful city. <laughs> And uh, it is just beautiful. Somebody told me before I left uh, Huntsville, said, now you're going to Toronto. Say, why in the world would you go to Toronto in the winter? Come on, somebody, in the winter. And I told him, it's not going to be so bad, but I lied. Amen. I, I, cold does not adequately describe what's been going on here. But we have had a great time going to the different malls and the sh we, they took me to some mall yesterday. What was the name of that mall you all went to yesterday? Yeah, I, I couldn't afford the chocolates at that mall yesterday, but we had a good time there. My wife is here, Sherry. Would you stand please, Sherry? She's the Director of Development there at Oakwood University. And of course, you've already, you've already seen George and his wife, Pamela. But y'all didn't come here for these introductions. How many of y'all want to learn a word from the Lord? Come on now. How many of y'all want a word from the Lord? It costs too much gas to drive all the way across town and not hear a word from the Lord. There's too much trouble in our homes not to hear a word from the Lord. We funeralize too many people to come to another church service and not hear a word from the Lord. Am I right about it? So let's stand to our feet as we go to the word. But as we stand to our feet, shake somebody's hand and just tell them I'm glad to be seated next to you. Shake somebody's hand. Two or three hands. Real good. And let's pick it up right here. If you know this song, how great, how great is our God, is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Just shake a few hands. How many of you know we serve a great God? is our God. Come on, let's join the choir and let's sing that song before we go to the Word. How great is our God? Is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? And all will see how great, how great is our God. Now you know that chorus. He's a name above all names. Everybody, he's a name. And he's worthy to be praised. And my heart will sing how great. How great is our God. Let's do it from the top. How great is our God is our God. Sing with me. I 
I want to turn your attention this afternoon to a passage that has been a blessing to me. And I want to talk to somebody today who's really going through something, somebody that needs God to move on their behalf. I want to know if I'm talking to the right crowd. Does anybody need God to move? Does anybody need him to move quick, fast, and in a hurry? Well, I'm talking to the right crowd. I want you to turn with me to the book of Matthew as we remain standing. I'm going to read just a few familiar verses from Matthew, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 21. I've been a little bit under the weather, but I wasn't going to miss this. Amen? And I want to invite and encourage those of you who can to be with us tonight at 6.30 as we celebrate the memory and the vision of Dr. Martin Luther King. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 15, beginning with verse 21, these words, I will read a few verses aloud. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the what, everybody? And look at Christ's response. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came, and they besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. But Jesus answered and said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But look at this woman's response. The Bible said, After all that Jesus said, after all of the interruptions, the woman worshipped Jesus Christ. And she said, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not me. It's not right. It's not appropriate to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. I like her response. I wonder how many of us would have responded this way. And she said, truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made, I like this, her daughter was, it doesn't take him long to move, her daughter was made whole from that very hour. God, we thank you for your power and your presence in this place. We thank you that the same God who worked miracles in this passage is here right now. And we thank you that we have the confidence that the blood still works. And so we pray, God, that you would touch these people who have come from different places. They've come with a sense of intentionality. We need a word from you. It's too late in the game. Too many things have gone on for us to be listening to the meandering words of another preacher if they're not anointed by the Spirit of the living God. So have your way. Put this preacher behind this desk in a way that makes it clear that Jesus is about to have a word. Thank you, God, already for what we know you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen? amen. Amen. You may be seated as you're going down. I want you to tell your neighbor that the preacher is speaking from the subject, how to get God's attention. How to get God's attention. My brothers and sisters, as we get about midway through the first month of another year, I am convinced that the most important lesson that you can learn in this life is how to get God's attention. I know that we have, some of us, already broken the resolutions that we made the first day of January because some of us were a bit hasty with the resolutions to lose weight and to smile more often and to eat this and to do that. Sometimes resolutions are easier made than to execute. I didn't hear nobody talk to me. But there are some things that are more important than these resolutions we make as important as they may be. And there's nothing that you can learn in life that is more important than how to get God's attention. Now, for some people, even the idea of wondering whether or not we are getting God's attention is interesting because they realize, as you realize, that God is omnipresent. 
God is always everywhere. He's already going where he's coming from. And so when you say that you need to get God's attention, bro, Pastor, what exactly are you talking about? The God that I serve is always attending to his children. Yes and yes. But there's, there's a way that you can communicate with God. There's a way that you can connect with God that might move him in a way that might not necessarily be experienced by everybody in your row. That's exactly what Peter was getting at uh, when the Bible says uh, he, in Luke 8, the woman with the issue of blood, I should say, got Jesus Christ's attention. And he cried out, Jesus, who touched me? Isn't you know what the Bible said? And the disciples quickly, uh, with much the same attitude that some of us have when we talk about getting God's attention, responded, Master, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody touched you. There are people who are sick to your left. There are people who are, are possessed to your right. There are people who are poverty stricken all around you. There are people who have waited for weeks to get close to you and everybody is close to you in this crowd. What do you mean somebody touched me? Everybody touched you. But Jesus says somebody in this crowd touched me a different way. I want to touch Jesus a different way. Let me be respectful to everybody in this auditorium today. I trust and pray that today you're going to get a blessing that's going to serve you well. But my determination every time I preach is that if don't nobody get blessed, excuse my English, let it be me. Come on, say amen. Even me, Lord, let some drops fall on me. Doesn't make me any difference how people respond. I want them to respond in the way that God wants them to respond. But I got my own issues. Anybody got their own issues? And I don't want to leave another worship service leaving the same way that I came into it. If you understand that, say praise the Lord. So Jesus will touch you in a way that will make you a different person. Jesus will touch you in a way that will change the way that you talk. Jesus will touch you in a way that will change your habits. He can break strong. Anybody believe that there's nothing too hard for Jesus? I want to make sure that I'm in the right place today. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand that there is nothing too hard for God. But you got to know how to get his attention. I say you got to know how to get God's attention. And let me tell you something. If you're really going to get God's attention... You can't be coy. You can't be cute. You got to go after God, as the Bible says, as the deer pants after the water. So my soul comes after you. The Bible puts it this way in another place. He said, you will seek me and you will find me if you do what, everybody? Search for me with all your heart. In other words, what the Bible is saying that you can't be half-stepping when it comes to getting a blessing from God. And I'm quick to tell you this. Some of us are still meandering through our Christian experience because you ain't really hurting yet. Some of us are still stumbling through our Christian experience because you really ain't broke yet. Some of us are still nonchalant about some of these powerful passages that we hear in our Sabbath sermons and we hear in our small groups and we hear in uh, Sabbath school. But when you, as somebody said earlier today, get to the point where you're good and tired, no, 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 sick and tired, of being sick and tired, you will go after God like you mean it. Come on, say praise the Lord. If you're going to get God's attention, you got to learn how to do this word. Just, what's this word I'm looking at? It's called pray. Somebody say pray. If you're really going to get God's attention, you have to pray. And can I tell you something? When it comes to prayer and talking to God, you might as well tell him exactly what's going on. Because can I tell a few folk, this might surprise half a dozen of y'all, he already knows what's going on. 
That might surprise about three of y'all. But the reality is God already knows how bad things are in your house. God already knows that you can't get off weed. God already knows that when you hit your finger with a hammer, you don't say praise the Lord. You still got issues. And so when you go to God, and if you, I'm talking about somebody that really wants change. Anybody who really wants change? If you really want change, the songwriter says you got to call him up. And you got to be clearly telling him what you want. Can I get a witness in this place? You can't surprise him because he made you. You can't upset him because he loves you. You can't hide from him because he sees you. You can't fool him because God knows you. So if you really want God's attention, you need to be plain with God. See, you can't talk to God like you talk to me. When I was pastoring, one of the most difficult things that I had to approach from week to week was counseling. Because the reality is, most folk who came to me for counseling, it would take me about three or four weeks till I got to the root of the problem. So they would lie for two weeks, and then I would find out what the real issue was. Don't do God like we do each other. If you want to get out of the mess that you're in, whether it's a self-made mess or whether it was imposed on you by somebody else, go to a power that can turn that thing around. And so you got to learn how to pray. And sometimes our prayers need to be, need, need, need to be shaped so as to, as to give a sense of the passion that we have for what we need. Am I right about it? We're talking about Martin Luther King today, and Martin Luther King had as one of his inspirations Sojourner Truth. How many of y'all have heard of Sojourner Truth? This woman knew how to pray. She wasn't enamored with these flowery prayers. Not that I have anything against flowery prayers. I teach Christian worship and liturgy. But there is a simple one-word prayer that is guaranteed always to get through. It's called help. Come on, somebody. And so Sojourner Truth knew how to go to God. And I brought a couple of her prayers, little brief prayers. This is how you get God's attention. Sojourner Truth was having some financial problems. And listen to this prayer. This is a prayer that gets God's attention. She said, oh Lord, you know I don't have no money. That's a prayer right there. Come on, say amen. Oh Lord, you know I don't have no money. She cut right to the chase. But you can make people do for me. And you must make people do for me. And then she said, and I won't give you no peace until you do. Amen. Come on, say prayer. That's a prayer. That's a real prayer. She was having problems another time. As a matter of fact, her son was sick. Anybody got kids that have been sick before? Nothing will drive you to your knees like a child going through something. So Journal Truth's son was sick. And she said this, she said, oh Lord, you know how distressed I am because I told you again and again. He said, now Lord, help my son. Then she threw this in parenthetically. She said, if you were in trouble, like I'm in trouble, don't you think I would help you? So why don't you help me? That might be unspiritual to some of y'all, but that's why your prayers ain't being answered. Come on, say amen. Brothers and sisters, this is the type of attitude, this is the type of passion that one needs to have when they get to the point that I can't survive doing it the way I've been doing. I can't continue to struggle the way that I have been struggling. And this woman in Matthew 15 was at the end of her rope. This leads me to, 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 to another question. Has anybody really almost gotten to the end of the rope? Now, I'm going to tell you now, you got to get to the end of the rope before certain things happen. Some of us have not broken through because we got a little too much rope left. But God is trying to get us not necessarily to the end of our ropes financially 
or educationally or socially, but he wants us to get to the end of ourselves. He wants us to get to the point where we realize that if anything of any real consequence happens, that it's not going to be by might, it's not going to be by power, but it's going to be by the spirit of the living God. And this woman had gotten to the end of her rope. The Bible says in verse 22, then Jesus went, departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. Don't miss this. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast. And this is what she's cried. She says, Master, have mercy on me. Why? Because my daughter is demon-possessed. Only a mother can adequately understand this mother's pain. You and I, who are not mothers, can identify with what's going on here. But in much the same way that doesn't make no sense telling people who just had a loved one to die, I know how you feel. You don't know how this woman feels. But the Bible has it here as an example of what life can do and what God can do to life. My daughter's vexed with a devil. Brothers and sisters, can I throw this in? Paul was right in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 when he said, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. And that was one of the problems. That is one of the problems with these resolutions and determinations that we make from year to year. We don't realize that at times we're fighting the right, wrong battle or fighting the wrong person. And the Bible says we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Your problem is not ultimately your husband. Your problem is the person that can get into your husband. Come on, say amen. Let me flip this thing before the folk get mad. And the same thing about your wife and your children. I know sometimes we can personalize things, but the reality is the devil has a full-time job. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's a manipulator. He's a killer. And this woman said, my daughter is demon-possessed. And let me tell you something, this woman might not have known what to do. And that's one of the things, let me throw this in too, I'm not going to charge you for this, but that was one of the most char challenging things for me when I was pastoring. I found out very quickly, brothers and sisters, that the devil ain't no game. Yes, sir. I'm not a person that's just fascinated with demonology and all these crazy stories that you hear and see, because frankly, half of them don't make no sense. They're not biblically based, but I do believe that the devil is real. I believe that God is greater, but the devil is real. I was in San Francisco doing an evangelistic campaign. I wasn't 24, 25 years old then, and uh, I was doing pretty good. Thought I preached a good sermon. After I preached the sermon, the pastor said, Doc, I went to Doc, he said, Pastor, could you come and we need to have special prayer. And I said, okay. And I went back to his office, and folk were in the room all in a circle with a light. It was almost stereotypical, a dimly lit room, a naked light bulb. And I said, man, this is not good. And so I get in there, and it's dark, people in a circle, and uh, they said, Pastor, why don't you come in? I said, okay. So I grabbed the hands of those, the woman to the left and the woman to the, to the right. And then the senior pastor says, uh, I want everybody to know that there's a woman in this room that's demon-possessed. And I did just what y'all did, got real, real, real quiet, just like that. <laughs> because at that time, quiet as it's kept, I was, I, was, I was not as spiritual as I am now. Come on, say amen, not as spiritual. And there were some things I was a little, ah, uh, some things undone. Come on, say amen. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so we put, we were grabbing hands, and I, leaned over to the preacher and I said, who is she? <laughs> no, I'm serious. I said, who, who is the lady that's demon possessed? And the pastor leaned in my ear and he said, it's that lady whose hands you have. <laughs> and I just knew somebody was going to jump out and say, Paul, I know. <laughs> Jesus.
Jesus I know, but who is he? And one incident after another convinced me that this ain't no game. Did you hear what I said? You might think that you got all the time in the world, but the devil knows that he's living on borrowed time. You might not believe that Jesus is coming again, but the devil hears a clock every time that he gets up in the morning. He knows that he's living on borrowed time. You might think that there's no help for you when the devil comes with all of his power and his imps, but I'm convinced that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If you believe that, shout amen in this place. And so this woman rushes into the presence of Jesus and here is his response. Verse 23, the Bible says that to this woman's request, Jesus answered her not a word. Did you, did you see his, he didn't say anything to the woman. There is nothing more debilitating than having a problem, going to the person who might have the solution, and hearing nothing. I mean, you don't want to be disrespectful, but tell me yes, I can handle a yes. And frankly, I can almost tolerate a no. But silence is devastating. Silence is debilitating. Silence makes you reevaluate your spiritual status and question those things that have undergirded you for all of your life. Silence will make you second guess your Sabbath school teacher. Silence will make you want to turn in your marriage certificate. Silence will do stuff to you that a yes or a no won't do. And so the Bible says that Jesus answered her another word. She calls on God and God puts this woman on hold. That's the problem. The silence of God will confuse you. But brothers and sisters, I came to tell you that up above our heads, there's more than music that's playing in the air. We're involved in what we have appropriately described as a great controversy. We're not wrestling against folk we can, as a matter of fact, we can't have beat up folk we can see. But we've got God on the right and we've got the devil on the left. And sometimes we wrestle with sickness and disease and, and depression, not because of anything that we've done specifically in our lives, but we're just caught between two giants. We're caught in the middle of a fight. You got one swing in here and you got one swing in there and you caught in the middle. Caught between giants. And there are people who are going around telling this lie that every trouble that you encounter, every trial that you experience has a direct line to some sin in your life. The devil is a liar. You can have problems while you're doing everything right. You can go broke while you're going to Sabbath school. You can get sick on your way to church. And it has nothing to do many times with anything other than this side of heaven. There's a certain latitude that the devil is afforded even to the children of God. But you got to recognize that no matter what the devil throws at you, the Bible declares that this is a light affliction. That don't make no sense to me. This is a light affliction. What do you mean this is a light affliction, Pa? I just saw my son go to jail. How is that a light affliction? My daughter just came from the hospital because she attempted suicide. How you call this a light affliction? There are things going on in my life that I can't explain. How you call this a light affliction? Paul says it's a light affliction when you see that the thing that's coming ahead. Come on, say praise the Lord. The thing that I have in store for you, God says, is going to make all of these issues that you wrestle with pale in comparison. If you believe that, shout amen. 
That's why you need to come to church even when you don't feel like coming to church. Because sometimes you need somebody to build your faith. Come on, say amen. You need to recognize that trouble won't last always. You need to recognize that the same God that brought your sister through can bring you through too. You need to recognize that there's strength in somebody else's testimony. And sometimes when you can't open your mouth, you can hear that God made a way for somebody else. He answered her not a word. Let me move because I'm almost done. What God is trying to accomplish in these these little specks of silence is this, he wants to know, he, he, this is what he wants to know. Can I tell you what he wants to know? Can I tell you what he wants to know? Yeah. He wants to know, do you trust me? In other words, he said, I know what your mouth just said, but do you trust me? Can you trust me? As the cliche goes, when you can't trace me. Can you trust me to do the right thing with your life even when folk are whispering in your ear? You see, I knew there wasn't anything about you. Can you trust me when everything that you've put confidence in is crumbling around you? And so I came to tell you that Christ's response to this woman was a calculated response. Didn't say a word. But then it gets complicated, even more complicated. And can I tell you something? I'm going to give you this for free too. Sometimes things get worse before they get better. And let me give you an example. In verse 23, the second uh, portion, it says, And his disciples, that's the church folk, y'all. Yes, yes. Let me write that. It, and his disciples, that's the deacons and the elders and the greeters. And whatever your office is that I didn't mention. Come on, say amen. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away. That's the church folk. The church folk. The folk who ought to have a word of encouragement. The folk who should be patting the woman and encouraging the woman on the back. Telling Jesus, send her away. And then they got the nerve to say, send her away, for she crieth after us. Well, first of all, you got a problem because she ain't talking to you no way. She's not crying after you. She's not speaking to you. She's trying to get to Jesus. And one of your problems is you don't know the difference between you and Jesus. Come on, say amen. I came to tell you that sometimes your greatest obstacles can be the folk that are closest to you. I didn't hear nobody talk to me. Some of, sometimes your, your greatest opposition can come from people who know you best. And, and sometimes that's not a pejorative. That's not a bad reflection on them in many instances. Because let me tell you something. The people that you live with, they know more about you than I do. They know. See, we see the deacon. They see the hell raiser. We see the deaconess. They see the person that's not living a life that's consistent with their testimony. And so we see people, but we really don't know people. But I, I, I'm kind of glad that the church is a hospital. I'm kind of glad. I'm kind of glad that God lets anybody in the church. I'm kind of glad that sometimes we seem to be more particular than God. I'm kind of glad that what God says is if there's a need, I want this person to come. If there's a problem, I want you to come to me because you're not going to fix it by yourself. Now that creates some problems because the church can be a crazy place. Did you hear what I just said? There's no crazy like church crazy. It's just not. It, has, it just has a, an element of it. As a matter of fact, I had an associate that I used to try to encourage all the time. I say, preacher, when he had issues, I say, preacher, always remember that the church is a hospital. I kept trying to tell him that, to encourage him. But then one day he got sick of that. And he said, pastor, you keep telling me that the church is a hospital, but you didn't tell me it's an insane asylum. 
Dry your eyes and keep walking. Come on, say amen. Because he who began a good work in you is going to be faithful to complete it. I came to tell you my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. This is not the preacher's church. This is God's church. This is not the Pathfinder Director's church. This is God's church. This is not the praise team's church. This is God's church. So I don't care what's going on. I'm going to stay with God. Come on, say amen. But this woman is still in a big problem. Start playing, man, because I'm, this could take a little longer than it should. Look at this woman's response. First, she's ignored by Jesus. And then she's interrupted by the saints, the super saints. And, 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 and the problem is that the saints' problem is primarily she's too loud, which is always an issue for people who've not really gotten to the end of the rope yet. Now, don't get me wrong. We have different tastes and we have different temperaments and volume is not an indicator of spirituality. But having said that, we holler for everything else that we need of importance. We cry for everything else that we need that's of any great importance. God says, I told you that you will seek me and you will find me when you search after me with everything that you have, it might very well be that the reason you don't have what I want you to have is because you're not searching for me with all that you have. God says, I know something about you. I said, God says, I know something about you. Some of you all have searched for a spouse with more intentionality and with more passion than you searched after me. That's why you're married, but you're disconnected from me. And others of you have filled out one application after another application looking for employment, but you got a job now, but you're unemployed spiritually. You will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with a, so first she's ignored by Jesus. She's interrupted by the saints. And then Jesus says, well, first of all, the woman worship. I almost skipped that. How in the world are you going to worship God in the middle of all of that? How in the world are you going to worship God when your daughter is demon possessed? How are you going to worship God when you're unemployed or, or when you have gotten a report that cancer is racking your body? How are you going to worship God? Well, brothers and sisters, what God is trying to explain to us is that real worship, somebody say real worship. Real worship is not driven by your emotions. Real worship is not driven primarily by who you are. Real worship is driven by who he is, not initially by what he's done, but real worship is driven by the reality of who God is. And I came to tell you that the God that you serve is good all the time. God is good when you are happy and God is good when you say it. God is good when you've got money in the bank, and God is good when you're broke. God is good when your kids are on time and, and obedient, but God is good when your child is walking into a courtroom. God is good because he's good by nature. And not only is God good, but he says, I'm working all things together for your good. If you just love me enough, I'm working stuff. See, the stuff that's going on in our lives that takes us by surprise, God saw it before you were born. 
and he says, I'm just working things together for your good. I heard a preacher say, my pastor says, it's, it's almost like a good point guard. Y'all got a basketball team here in Toronto. I'm not a fan of Toronto, so I'm going to use the Clippers. Come on, say amen. And so Chris Paul is a point guard. Y'all got a decent point guard too, but I'm talking about Chris Paul. And so Chris Paul is the kind of point guard that knows where his teammates are even when they don't know where he is. You can watch the Clippers play. And sometimes Blake and those others are running through their little routes and they'll get the ball thrown at them. And sometimes it pop and hits them on the head because they ain't looking up. They don't realize that the point guard sees them when they don't see the point guard. And the amazing thing is they crying for the ball. They arguing for the ball. But the point guard is just waiting for them to get in the position to score. And sometimes we don't realize that we've got a heavenly point guard. And sometimes we're running around helter-skelter in the hospital, in the unemployment line. But our point God is just waiting for us to get in the position where we can score. Score for the kingdom. Score for your family. But that ain't going to never happen for you, excuse my English, if you get out of line. If you jump out of the waiting room right before he operates on you. And so Jesus says, it's not right for me to give the children's bread to a dog. Now, can I add this? For most of us, that whole story after that dog word would not have been in the Bible because you would have just stomped out. Ain't nobody calling me no dog. You can't call. And that's another reason that you're not blessed when God wants to bless you. Because if you really need something, your attitude is I don't care what you call me. You can call me anything. But as long as I know I'm a child of God, it's all right with me. And the woman said, truth, Lord. And this is a commercial. I'm not charging you extra for this either. But if God says anything about you, the best thing for you to do is just say, truth, Lord. I don't care if you are PhD, DD, MD. If he says that you got a particular issue, don't be arguing with God. Just say, that's true, that's true. You got a bad temper. That's true, God. That's true. You're intemperate. That's true. That is true. You got a bad attitude. That, that's kind of harsh, but that's true too. You've got to know that God is trying to work out his will through you and in you. And finally, the woman said, that's true. But I know what your mouth is saying. But I heard too much about you to believe this little surface denial. You see, I heard that there were cities that you would go into. And everybody in the city would leave here. I heard that you got disciples who were cussers and, and gangbangers and all kind of riffraff, but you got them following you. I heard that you can work miracles and that you would never say, uh, I'm casting you away if a sincere person came. And so she fixed her mind on the word for dog that he used, and some of you all are experts in biblical language. That's my feel. I'm not a Greek expert, but I do know that there are different words for dog. And the word that Jesus used in that passage was not a typical street dog. It wasn't the dogs that frequented the streets, the dusty streets. Jesus used another word. The word that he used was closer to a pet. And the woman said, that's true. 
I might be a dog, but I ain't no stray dog. I'm not a mutt. I got an owner because I'm a pet dog and my master is going to take care of me. You got to have that same attitude if you want the Lord to work something in your life. Jesus said, that's faith. That other stuff that y'all been hearing, that ain't real faith. That's faith that reveals itself in attitude and action. Stand to your feet. Everybody stand. He's the bread of life sent down from glory. Many things you are on earth, a holy king, a carpenter, you are the living word, he's an awesome ruler, he's a gentle redeemer, he's God in us the living truth, what a friend we have in you. You are the living, call his name Jesus, Jesus, that's what we call you, that's what we call, that's who we're talking about, he's manger born but on a tree, yes, I'm glad you died, so glad you died, everybody in this building, call his name Jesus. That's what we call you. Come on, get what you need from God. Major boy, but on a tree. I'm glad you died. So glad you died. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come at the end of this service just calling one name. That name is Jesus. Now I want you to bow your heads and I want everybody in this place to close your eyes. I preach everywhere and I will preach at the drop of a hat and bring my own hat, but I don't preach to hear myself preach. God sent me to Toronto, not only to speak this afternoon, but he sent me to speak life into somebody in this building right now. We came into this building dressed up looking good in fellowship with our brothers and sisters of like faith. But you can be connected to a church but disconnected from God. You can have your name on a church roll but be totally disconnected from God. Well, bro, Pastor, how can I get connected to Jesus? You can get connected to Jesus with two words. Just as two words move me from single to married, I do. Two words can move you from lost to saved. I believe. I believe you'll forgive me. I believe you'll save me. I believe you'll wash my sins away. I believe that no weapon formed against me will prosper. I believe that the same Jesus in this passage can take care of my life. Now listen, I don't know who you are, but there might be somebody under the sound of my voice who wants to leave this sanctuary today with the assurance that it might not be well with my soul, but it is well with me and Jesus Christ. And I don't know what your issue is. You might be coming to Jesus for the very first time, or you might be coming in the spirit of rededication, reaffirmation. But if you want to come to this altar today saying, bro, pastor, I want to leave this place with the assurance that my sins have been forgiven. Come now, come now, now, now. Now, come right now, whatever it is. I know that some of us have been blessed to have it all together, but for somebody who might be the slightest bit uncertain or insecure, there are certain things that you can't be foggy about, and that is how it is with your Savior, your relationship with your God. 
And so if there's somebody, and this is not a general appeal, because in a, a church like this, it is assumed that the vast majority of those under the sound of my voice are moving forward, sometimes up, sometimes down, but there are always people in settings like this who are not sure. And we want you to be crystal clear as you leave this place that the Lord has you, he's forgiven you, and salvation is yours. Let's sing that one more time when we close. Call his name Jesus. That's what we call you. Manger born but on a tree. I'm glad you died. So glad you died. One more time. Call his name Jesus. Oh, yeah, yeah. Manger born, manger born. Hey, Wayne, give me one second. Stop. Listen to me before we leave. This is the evangelist in me, and I'm out your way. I've been in Adventist long enough, and I've preached in enough places long enough, Adventist and not, to know there's some of you all who are in a broken situation, and you're trying to wake me out. I'm not going to be up here forever, but God's grace is extended to you right now. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. What I'm simply asking you, and I'm about to pray, but I'm serious about what I do. If you're not absolutely positively sure that it is well with you and God, you need to come to this altar right now. Call his name Jesus. That's what we call you. He's a manger born. Ooh, oh. Thank you, Lord. One last time, call his name Jesus. Oh, yes. Ooh, oh. Nutty. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you that it might take us years to get into a mess, but it don't take you but a moment to get us out of it. And even though some might be physically struggling through the miasma of bad habits and strongholds, because we believe in the power of God and the grace that he extends, we believe that we have the confidence that we are saved and a part of his kingdom right now. What a blessed assurance I have that Jesus is mine. And so, God, we pray that you would keep us strong, keep us encouraged, and keep us focused on that appointment that we have with you to meet at a place where the wicked shall cease from trouble and the weary soul shall be at rest. Thank you for those who've responded today. We give you praise, glory, and honor. On this day when we gather in numbers to celebrate the memory of Dr. Martin Luther King, we thank you for that gospel preacher who changed a nation. And more than that, we thank you for the God of Dr. King who changed our lives. Bless, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Put your hands together as you go to your seats and thank God. <laughs>